person who've been misused or abused. Recently, a policeman who knelt on the neck of someone, the person actually died. The policeman was placed on bail and security had to be arranged so that people would not protest and go looking for that policeman to do him any harm because they viewed his release on bail as injustice to the person whose life he took and to the family. There is a cry for justice all over the world and our subject is justice for the oppressed and God is a God of justice. Our theme for this week is freedom from fear. Freedom from fear. And I will have this foremost in my mind as I present the messages I believe God has given to me. Now, I want us today to take a close look at God. There's a complaint that God makes from time to time in the Bible. Let us go to Jeremiah chapter 2, verse 5. Jeremiah chapter 2, verse 5. Our subject, justice for the oppressed. And I read from the King James Version of the Bible. You may follow from any version that you have, but my preferred version for reading and speaking is the King James Version. Jeremiah chapter 2, verse 5, the Bible says, Thus saith the Lord, What iniquity have your fathers found in me, that they are gone far from me, and have, and have walked after vanity, and are become vain? What iniquity have your fathers found in me? God is speaking to the Israelites, your forefathers, your ancestors. What can they say about me? What sin, what iniquity, what wrongdoing have I ever done to them? Of course, the obvious answer is none. In Micah chapter 6, verse 3. Micah chapter 6, verse 3. Hear ye, O mountains, the Lord's controversy. Well, we're reading from verse 2, then we go to 3. And ye strong foundations of the earth. God is calling the earth to witness what he's about to say. For the Lord hath a controversy with his people, and he will plead with Israel. What is the controversy God has with his people that is so serious that he calls the mountains to stand as witnesses? He calls the foundations of the earth to be witnesses. Verse 3, O oh my people, this is God speaking, what have I done unto thee? And wherein have I wearied thee? Testify against me. This is a very serious verse. <clears throat> we'll read it again. We'll read it closely. Oh, my people. Michael 6, verse 3. What have I done unto thee? Now, I'll ask you that question. What wrong thing has God ever done to you? What injustice has God ever done to you? And God is asking that question of the Israelites back in Micah's day, but those people are all dead. So is Micah. So he's directing that question to us. We are his people. We love his word. We love him. That's what we say. And God is asking us today, oh, my people of uh, New Life, FDA Church in Berlin, what have I done unto you? And wherein have I wearied thee? In other words, how have I been a burden to you? This is God's question to the Israelites. Of course, they could not answer. Let us go to John chapter 15. John 15, we read from verse 22. Our subject, justice for the oppressed. John 15, reading from verse 22, and I will pray again. Father, continue to control my mind and my mouth. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. John 15, reading from verse 22. If I had not come and spoken unto them, they had not had sin. But now they have no cloak for their sin. He that hateth me, hateth my father also. Verse 24. If I had not done among them the things which none other man did, they had not had sin. But now have they both seen and hated both me and my father. Now listen to verse 25. But this cometh to pass, that the word might be fulfilled that is written in their law, they hated me without a cause. What that verse is simply saying, no one has ever had a just cause to be angry with God. 
we have to see God differently. There are many believers who see God as someone who has deprived them of some privilege, has withheld from them some blessing. We see God that way. But the Bible presents God as someone who does not do wrong to anyone. Listen to Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 4. Deuteronomy, the fifth book of the Bible, chapter 32, verse 4. For he is a rock. His work is perfect. All his ways are judgment, meaning all that he does is right. A God of truth and without iniquity, just and right is he. God is always right. God is always just. And we need to understand that when dealing and interacting with God. Because as I said earlier, many of us, and I mean believers, have a deformed, warped, and twisted view of God. Psalm 145, verse 17. The Lord is righteous in all his ways and holy in all his works. The Lord is righteous. In all his ways, there are no exceptions to this principle, and holy in all his works. Everything God does is right. In Hebrews 11, verse 6, we have a verse that is very familiar. Let's look at it closely. Hebrews 11, verse 6, our subject, justice for the oppressed. The Bible says, but without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh unto God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. I'll read that again. But without faith, it is impossible to please God. Now listen carefully. For he that cometh to him must believe first that he is then he's a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Sometimes we come to God first as a rewarder of them that diligently seek him, but we leave out the part that says that we must believe that he is, that comes first, so that whether he rewards us or not, he still is. What is he? He is good. Psalm 100, verse 5, For the Lord is is good. Whether he blesses you or not, God is good. This is a constant that upon which you and I must stand. It must be a foundation stone in our relationship with God. God is always good. What else is God? Micah 7 verse 18. <clears throat> Excuse me. Who is a God like unto thee that pardoneth iniquity, and passeth by the transgression of the remnant of his heritage. He retaineth not his anger forever, <clears throat> because he delighteth in mercy. God loves to show mercy. That's what he is. And so Hebrews 11 verse 6 says, Without faith it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is. My listening friend, what is he? God is good. What is he? God is merciful. What is he? God is long-suffering. What is he? God is abundant in goodness and truth. What is he? God is forgiving. What is he? God is love. First John chapter 4, verse 8. He that loveth not, knoweth not God, for God is love. Let me say that again. It is not God has love. God is love. And everything God does is an expression of that love. The love of God is the fountainhead. It is the source from which everything God does springs. His mercy springs from his love. His long-suffering springs from his love. His willingness to forgive springs from his love. His uh, whatever, his ability to, to take abuse springs from his love. Our subject, justice for the oppressed. What justice am I referring to? We need to change our view of God. We need to see God as a source of blessing, a source of strength, a source of mercy, a source of compassion, a source of forgiveness, and not a God who deprives us of the desires of our hearts. We, in many ways, have been 
unjust to God. And if you think there are people in the world who are oppressed <clears throat> and who need justice, there is no one who needs justice more than God because no one is more oppressed as God who is oppressed by sin. And as far as the Bible chronology goes, for 6,000 years, God has been oppressed by sin. <clears throat> God hates sin. And we live in a world that is steeped in sin. And when God looks, all God sees north, south, east, and west is sin. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 1, verse 9, Thou hast loved righteousness and hated iniquity. God hates iniquity, and the very thing he hates is the very thing we keep presenting before God by the way we live our lives. God is oppressed by sin, and the oppressed need justice, and no one, as I said earlier, is more oppressed than God. We must change our view of God. God is a loving God. And I will deal with that a little more from this point on. God is a loving God, despite the fact he is constantly oppressed by sin. Let us read 1 John 4, verse 8 again. I read it earlier. 1 John chapter 4, verse 8. Let me pray again. Father in heaven, as I talk about you very directly, guide my mind, dear God, and my mouth. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. He that loveth not, that's 1 John chapter 4, verse 8. He that loveth not, knoweth not God. For God is love, in verse 16. And we have known and believed the love that God has to us. God is love. And so we have it in two verses in 1 John 4, verse 8, verse 16. God is love. But what is love? What are the elements of love? Does the Bible define love? The answer is yes. One definition is the cross of Christ. And we'll get to another. John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. This is the definition of love. The love of God is expressed in his giving everything he had when he gave Jesus Christ. And by the way, in giving Jesus Christ, God gave himself. Now, I cannot explain the details of that transaction. All I can tell you biblically is in giving Jesus Christ, God gave himself. The love of God is the giving to a degree that we cannot understand, not even the angels can fully understand this expression of God's love. Now, I said in giving Christ, God gave himself. The Bible says God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself. He was in Christ. So the sufferings of Christ were the sufferings of God. God gave himself through Jesus Christ. It is a transaction only Christ and the Father could have developed. For God so loved the world. But I want you to read that verse differently. I want you to listen to the verse and read it as though you are the only person on the face of the earth. And that verse was written for you. Why do I say that? Listen to Steps to Christ, page 100. One paragraph one, Steps to Christ, page 100, paragraph one. The relations between God and each soul are as distinct and full as though there were not another soul upon the earth to share his watch care, not another soul for whom he gave his beloved son. What the writer of those words is saying, God interacts with you as if no one else on the earth needs him or is alive. Let me say that again. God deals with you as if you are the only person on the face of the earth. Now, this is personal love. In many families, and I heard some discussion during Sabbath school about family life, in many families, people compete, children compete for the affection of their parents. There is no need to compete for affection when it comes to God, because in a way that God alone fully understands, when you talk to God, 
when you interact with God, God deals with you as if you are the only person talking to him. Now keep this in mind and listen to John 3.16 again as we continue justice for the oppressed. And that oppressed person is God and the oppression is sin. For God so loved the world. Let me take my sister Jacinta, Sister Otiemo. For God so loved Sister Otiemo. This is a correct reading of the Bible. For God so loved Randy, for God so loved whomever, that he gave his only begotten son for you. Love is personal. That if you believe in him, you will not perish, but have everlasting life. This is a condensed definition of sin, uh, of love, sorry. The love of God is the giving of God of all that he had. Because in giving Jesus Christ, God gave the creator. In giving Jesus Christ, he gave the one who sustains the entire creation. In giving Jesus Christ, he gave the one of whom it is said, in him we live and move and have our being. In giving Christ, God gave everything. And so when the Bible says God is love, how do we understand that? We go to the cross of Christ, which is also the cross of God. Because the Bible calls the gospel the gospel of Christ. It also calls it the gospel of God. We go to Calvary, which is the cross of Christ and the cross of God, and we look at Calvary and we see as far as our limited minds can grasp a definition of the love of God. But the Bible has another definition. It's no different. It is just more expanded. Let us go to 1 Corinthians chapter 13. We'll read from verse 1. 1 Corinthians 13, reading from verse 1, our subject, justice for the oppressed. And if someone has recently joined us, thank you for joining us, and may the Lord bless you. Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not charity, I am become a sounding brass or a tingling cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains and have not charity, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned, and have not charity, it profiteth me nothing. Now, the word charity is actually love, agape. It is love. But the translators use the word charity. So when you hear charity, think of love. Verse 4, charity suffereth long and is kind. Charity envieth not. Charity vaunteth not itself, is not puffed up. Now, we can virtually say God suffereth long and is kind. God envieth not. God vaunteth not himself. God is not puffed up. Because God is love. And to begin this series of freedom without fear, we have to have a proper understanding of God. Because when we understand God, this is step one in living life without fear because we know who is in charge of our lives. Verse 4, 1 Corinthians 13. Charity suffereth long. What is charity? Love and is kind. God is long-suffering. That's why we're still alive. In Psalm 130, verse 3, If thou, Lord, shouldst mark iniquity, O Lord, who shall stand? But there is forgiveness with thee. There is forgiveness with God. There is long-suffering with God. There is patience with God. That's why we are still alive. And so charity suffereth long and is kind. That's what God is. God is kind. Charity envieth not. Charity vaunteth not itself, is not puffed up. It is amazing to consider that the God of heaven and earth is not puffed up, meaning is not proud. Let's get a glimpse of the humility of God. If anyone has a right to be proud, it is God. Yet God is the humblest being in the universe. Listen to Philippians chapter 2, verse 5. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, 
that's as high as you can go, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of man. He made himself of no reputation. I suppose if you lived in England, you would love to be knighted because sir this and sir that, or be made a dame or OBE, or each country has its own honor and citizens, they, they covet that honor. Jesus Christ made himself of no reputation, took upon him the form of a servant, that's humility, and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. All death is not the same. If I had to choose to die, I would not choose to be eaten by lions. I would not choose to be burned in a furnace. I would not choose to be stoned to death. I would choose a painless gas. Let me inhale it. Let me die with a smile on my face. Or I may choose a lethal injection. Not all death is the same. The Bible says he humbled himself <clears throat> and became obedient unto death. But his humility was such it went all the way down even the death of the cross. And so when we read in 1 Corinthians 13, verse 4, charity envieth not, charity vaunteth not itself, is not puffed up, you serve a humble God. Regardless of the simplicity and the humility and the basic nature of your circumstances, God understands because God in Christ humble himself. There is no pride in love. The God who loves you is not proud. And so verse 4 says, Charity envieth not. Charity vaunteth not itself, is not puffed up. Verse 5, doth not behave itself unseemly. This is love. Seeketh not her own. Let me pause on that. Seeketh not her own. God's emphasis is always someone else's welfare which is contrary to the way we think. Let me say that again by giving you 1 Corinthians 13, 5. Doth not behave itself unseemly, God never behaves badly. Seeketh not her own. And by the way, God requires that of us. God does not place his interest first. He places our interest first. That's why he sent someone equal with himself at the risk of loss. Meditate on these words. Charity doth not behave itself unseemly, seeketh not her own, is not easily provoked, thinketh no evil, but let me still pause on seeketh not her own. Philippians chapter 2, verse 3, let nothing be done through strife of in glory, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than himself. Now, this is a very, very significant verse and very challenging. That verse can only be activated in the life when the life is given to Christ and conversion has taken place. Listen again to verse 3 of Philippians 2. Let nothing, there's no exception, let nothing, whether in the church or in the family, on the job site, let nothing be done through strife of in glory. But in lowliness of mind, that's humility, let each esteem other better than themselves. This is God. This is love. Love is humble. Now, consider this. If we practice this principle of love, esteeming others better than ourselves, if we actually practice this principle, there could be no tribal wars. There would be no crime. Yes, we live in a world of sin. We live in a world of sin. But the, the tremendous degree of crime and violence that characterizes this world would not be the case. Why? Because we do not hurt that which we value. A God of love values us so much, he took the hurt that we deserve by sending his son to die on the cross and through his son giving himself. Let me say that again. God values us so much, but let me be particular, God values you so much that the pain, the hurt, the suffering you deserve as a sinner, and I deserve as a sinner, God took it because he valued you and me so highly. Let each esteem other 
better than themselves. We need to understand that the God we serve is a God who places our best interest at the very highest level. How high is that level? The sacrifice of Jesus Christ. God seeks the well-being and the welfare of others. And he calls upon us to live that way. That's the principle that operates throughout nature if sin had not entered. Listen to uh, this word, these words from The Desire of Ages, page 20, paragraph two. Our subject, justice for the oppressed. The Desire of Ages, page 20, paragraph two. Let me pray first. Father, continue to guide my mind and my mouth. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Listen very carefully. There is nothing save the selfish heart of man that lives unto itself. No bird that cleaves the air, no animal that moves upon the ground, but ministers to some other life. There is no leaf of the forest or lowly blade of grass, but has its ministry. Every tree and shrub and leaf pours forth that element of life without which neither man nor animal could live. And man and animal in turn minister to the life of tree and shrub and leaf. The flowers breathe fragrance and unfolds their beauty in blessing to the world. The sun sheds its light to gladden a thousand worlds. The ocean, itself the source of all our springs and fountains, receives the streams from every land, but takes to give. The mists ascending from its bosom fall in showers to water the earth, that it may bring forth and bud. What is that quotation saying? Everything created was created for the benefit of something else. Nothing was created for its own sake. How does that apply to God? God does and acts for our benefit. And the greatest proof of that is Calvary. I'm discussing the kind of God who desires to save you and who desires to bless you. He places your interests at the very highest level. And so I read again, 1 Corinthians 13, verse 3. Doth not behave itself unseemly, that's love. Seeketh not her own, is not easily provoked, thinketh not evil, is not easily provoked. Now that does not apply to many of us. Many of us are easily provoked. The Bible says virtually it takes a lot to provoke God. And even after he is provoked, he lays aside his anger very quickly. Why? Because he delights in mercy. God, the love God has for you, is not easily provoked. No wonder Jesus told the disciples, if someone offends you 70 times, seven in a day, forgive that person. Why would Jesus say that? Because that's precisely the way God is. We sin, he forgives. We sin, he forgives. We sin, he forgives. He is not easily provoked. It does not mean that God will tolerate sin forever, but it means it takes a lot to provoke God to righteous anger, is not easily provoked, thinketh no evil. Let's pause on that as we consider love, which is what God is. God thinks no evil of you. Jeremiah 29, verse 11. For I know the thoughts I think towards you, saith the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil. God has no evil thoughts regarding anyone. That's the way love is. That's the God who desires to save you. That's the God who tells you through Jesus Christ, come unto me. All ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Who is that God? A God who puts your interests first. A God who's not easily provoked. A God who is not puffed up. A God who sent his son to die for you individually. Seeketh not her own, is not easily provoked, thinketh no evil. Verse 6, 1 Corinthians 13. Rejoiceth not in iniquity, but rejoiceth in the truth. Beareth all things, verse 7, believeth all things, hopeth all things, endureth all things. Let me pause on that. Well, before I pause on 7, let me just take a look at 6. Rejoiceth not in iniquity. God takes no pleasure in my sins. God is long-suffering. God is forgiving. 
God forgets when he forgives. However, he forgets. I don't understand, but he forgets when he forgives. The Bible says he casts all our sins into the depth of the sea, Micah 7, verse 19. That's the way God is. He does not rejoice when we do wrong. It breaks his heart. If he doesn't rejoice, what's the opposite? He grieves over our sins. And he's grieving now because someone somewhere is offending God. Rejoiceth not in iniquity, but rejoiceth in the truth. Ah, let me pause on that. When you decide to obey God, to follow the truth, you put a smile on God's face. He rejoices in truth. When you decide to keep the Sabbath holy, God rejoices because this is truth according to the Bible. When you decide whatever to return a faithful tithe, you put a smile on God's face because this is truth and God rejoices in the truth. When you choose finally to forgive that person who offended you 30 years ago, you put a smile on God's face. Why? Because God rejoices in the truth and forgiveness is a Bible truth that many of us Ought to follow more faithfully. God rejoices in truth. He does not rejoice in iniquity. It means he hates my sins, but he loves me and desires to have me walk in the path of truth because truth is life. Verse 7 Beareth all things, believeth all things, hopeth all things, endureth all things. This is very, very powerful. Beareth all things. Mothers who are listening to me, no matter what your children do to you, you love them and you take it. And if someone tries to criticize that child who is abusing you, you will jump on that person. Mothers, you understand what I'm saying. You bear so much from your children. Fathers, you do the same, but let me talk to the mothers who actually carry the child. God bears long with us. Whatever we do, God takes it, hoping that at some point we will respond to his love. He beareth all things. But notice this, God believeth all things. What does God believe? Let me tell you. God believes you can change. God believes you can stop drinking. God believes you can stop taking drugs. God believes you can stop running around with women and men. God believes you can stop take, stealing the tithe. God believes you can stop working on Sabbath. He believes. And he calls upon us to respond to that faith that he has in us. It is not saving faith. God does not need saving faith. When we respond to God, we're exercising saving faith. But God believes, or let me say it this way, God has confidence in us. Because he knows if we will connect with him through Christ, there is no victory that we cannot win. My listening friend, God believeth all things. The next statement, he hopeth all things. God is hoping. At the end of this message, or even before, during the message, you will make a decision regarding your relationship with God. God is hoping that by the end of this week, a life will be given to him. God is hoping that you will make changes in your lives and be more business-like, industrious, and responsible, and serious. God is hoping you'll spend more time with your textbooks than on the television and social media. God is hoping. It's a blessing to serve a God who hopes. The Bible says in Romans 8, 24, for we are saved by hope. Hope is essential. Now abideth these three, faith, love, of charity, hope, and faith. Hope is an essential quality, and God exercises that quality. He hopeth all things. He endureth all things. God is a God of love, but he's a God under oppression, and he needs justice. And there is no better justice we can give to God, but to begin to see God as a God who only cares about us, desires to save us, to grant us an entrance into his kingdom, and even before that occurs, to bless us in this life right now. God wants to bless you. God wants to sustain you, but he wants to do it his way. Because since he is God, he knows the end from the beginning. God knows what is best for you. God loves you. And the way you and I can ease God's oppression and see to it that God receives justice in our lives is to surrender our lives to him and to live an obedient life to a God who through his son gave his life for us. My listening friend, 
God is issuing an invitation to you in Matthew eleven twenty eight. Come unto me. It is Christ speaking, but he's speaking for the Father. Because Christ says repeatedly, the words he spoke, he got from the Father. So the Father speaking through Christ says to you, come unto me. All ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. I'll suggest something to you. Think about it. Your biggest problem is not joblessness. My biggest problem is not I need a better car or I need another degree. Our biggest problem and our heaviest burden is sin. There's war in this world because of sin. There's abuse because of sin. There's human trafficking because of sin. Remove sin and every problem in the world vanishes. Our problem is sin and sin continues to oppress God. And God wants to lift that burden of sin from your life and from mine. And God says to us, come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, I will give you rest. And rest begins with the lifting of the burden of sin. When that burden goes, all of the burdens become easier to bear. God wants to save you. God wants to bless your life. And he wants to do that beginning now. And so I ask you to respond to the invitation of Matthew eleven twenty eight. 28. Come unto me. Not a building. To God. A person. Through Christ, we come to God. Come to him. And he gives a guarantee. I will give you rest. God cannot lie. Titus chapter 1, verse 2. Numbers 23, verse 19. John 14, verse 6. Deuteronomy 32, verse 4. He's a God of truth. Jesus is truth. The Holy Spirit is truth. The heavenly family cannot lie. God has promised to give you rest. And part of that rest is removing the fear that you have for tomorrow or whatever concerns you may have about your children, your family, your career, your job, whatever it is. The life that is placed into the hands of God is a life that is lived without fear. Accept that invitation now. You do not have to move. You respond to that invitation in your mind, in your heart, by surrendering your life to Christ. You simply say, Father, I've heard your call. I surrender my life to you. Direct me, guide me, and lead me. You simply say that with all of your heart, and God will do precisely that. Let's bow our heads and pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for being a good God. You are misunderstood God, not because of anything you've not done or done, but because we have not made the effort to understand this loving God. Forgive us, dear God, for oppressing you with our sins, because you deserve justice, and there is no greater justice than for us to live an obedient life so that our lives bring glory to your name and not oppression. Father, I believe everyone listening to me desires a place in your kingdom. Everyone under the sound of my voice, if that person were asked, do you love God? The person would say yes. Father, you've said to us, if you love me, obey me. Put into our hearts, dear God, a desire to please you by living a life according to your word. Bless every individual, dear God, young and old, man, woman, boy and girl. Bless our guests. Let us meditate on what we've heard that the God of heaven and earth, the God who made the universe just by speaking, the God who maintains the universe by the same word, is a God who wants to be our personal one-to-one -one God. Bless us, Father, and prepare us for this afternoon's service, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen.